Uh, why don't you sit here? Go sit here. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, before we get started, I, I think uh, you know there were some pioneers. Of course, uh, we have the pioneers uh, here on stage, but there were some other really important pioneers in the video we just saw, and a couple of them are here in the audience. So, uh, Mitch Kapor, who is a regular at D, could you just stand up and wherever you are, there he is. And, and Fred Gibbons, who has not come to D before, but is here tonight. Fred. There's Fred. Right there. And I don't know if he's in the room, but I do want to recognize uh, our, our fellow journalist, Brent Schlender from Fortune, who did the last, to my knowledge, the last joint interview these guys did. It was not on a stage, but it was a Fortune magazine interview. Brent, I, I don't know if you're in the room, if you are. Can you stand? Maybe he's oh, right back there. Right over there. So, um, so let's get started. Um, I wanted to ask. Uh, there's been a lot of like mano a mano cat fight kind of thing in a lot of the blogs and the press and stuff like that. And we wanted to. The first question I kind of was interested in asking is what you think each has contributed to the computer and technology industry. Starting with you, Steve, for Bill and. Vice versa. Um, well, you know, Bill built the first software company in the industry. And uh, I think he built the first software company before anybody really in our industry knew what a software company was, except for these guys. And that was huge. That was really huge. And the business model that they ended up pursuing turned out to be the one that worked really well, you know, for the industry. Mm -hmm. So. I think, but the, the, the biggest thing was Bill was really focused on software before almost anybody else had a clue that, that it was really the software. It was that's, that's what I see. I mean, I, a lot of other things you could say, but that's the high order bit. And I think building a company is really hard. Yeah. And, and it, requires, it requires your greatest persuasive abilities to hire the best people you can and keep them, keep them, keep them at your company and keep them working, you know, doing the best work of their lives, hopefully. And uh, Bill's been able to stay with it for all these years. So, Bill, how about the contribution of Steve and Apple? Well, first I want to clarify, I'm not fake Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what Steve's done is quite phenomenal. You know, if you look back to 1977, that Apple II computer, the idea that it would be a mass market machine. Uh, you know, the bet that was made there by Apple uniquely, there were other people with products, but the idea that this could be an incredible empowering phenomena, Apple pursued that dream. Uh, you know, then uh, one of the most fun things we did was the Macintosh, and that was so risky. You know, people may not remember that Apple really bet the company. Lisa hadn't done that well, and uh, you know, some people were saying, okay, that general approach wasn't good, but the team that Steve built, even within the company, to pursue that, uh, even some days it felt a little ahead of its time. Uh, I don't remember that Twiggy disk drive. And, 128K. Yeah. Uh, and... Ah, uh, the Twiggy disk drive, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Steve gave a speech once, which is one of my favorites, where he talked about, in, in a certain sense, we build the products that we want to use ourselves. Uh, and you know, so he's really pursued that with incredible taste and elegance that has had a, a huge impact on the industry. Uh, and his ability to always come around and figure out where that next bet should be uh, has been phenomenal. You know, Apple literally was failing when Steve went back and. Uh, reinfused the uh, innovation and risk taking that have uh, been phenomenal. So the industry's benefited immensely uh, from his his work. We've both been lucky to be part of it, but uh, you know I'd say he's contributed as much as anyone. Um, well, we've also we've yeah, also ahead. both been incredibly lucky to have had great partners that we started the companies with, and we've attracted great people. I mean, so. Uh, Everything that's been done at Microsoft and at Apple has been done by just 
remarkable people, uh, none of which are sitting up here, you know, today. Well, not us. Well, you're sort of the... Not, you, <laughs> not, not, not us. <laughs> and you're sort of... You're, so, you're, in a way, you're the stand-ins for all those, all yeah, those other people. in a way, we are. Um, in a very tangible way. So, Bill mentioned the Apple II in 1977 and <clears throat> 30 years ago, and there were a couple of other computers with... Uh, which were uh, aimed at the idea that average people might be able to use them. And looking back on it, an a really average, average person might not have been able to use them uh, by today's standards, but it certainly broadened the base of who could use computers. I actually looked at, a, uh, at an Apple ad from 1978. It was a print ad that shows you how ancient it was. And, uh, and it said, thousands of people have discovered the Apple computer. Thousands of people. <laughs> Uh, and it also said, you don't want to buy one of these computers where you put a cartridge in. I think that was a, a reference to one of the Atari or something. I don't know. You want a computer you can write your own programs on. And so the world, and obviously people we had some, still We do, had some but. very strange ads back then. We had one where it was in a kitchen, and there was a, a, a woman that looked like the wife, and she was typing in recipes on the computer with the husband looking on approvingly in the back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah, how did that work for you? <laughs> uh, I don't think well. <laughs> so, um, but, but just think back to, I, I know that you started Microsoft prior to 1977. You, I think Apple started the year before in 76. 76. Microsoft in 74, 74 was 75. Right the and then, but, yeah, then we did the ba ship the basic in 75. Okay. Um, most people, uh, I, some people here, but I don't think most people know that there was actually a, a, some Microsoft software in that Apple II computer. Do you want to talk about what happened there or how that, how that occurred? Yeah, the, uh, the, there had been the Altair and a few other companies, actually about 24, that had done various machines. But the 77 group included the PET, uh, TRS-80, and the Com yeah. Yeah, Commodore PET. Uh, TRS-80, and the Apple II. The original Apple II basic, the integer basic, uh, we had nothing to do with. But then there was a floating point one uh, where, uh, and I mostly worked with Waz on that. Uh, I made it. Well, let me tell this story. <laughs> so Waz, <laughs> Waz, my partner, we started out with this guy named Steve Wozniak, brilliant, brilliant guy. He writes this basic that is like the best basic on the planet. It does stuff that no other basic's ever done. You don't have to run it to find your error messages. It finds them when you type it in and stuff. It's perfect in every way, except for one thing, which is it's, it's just fixed point, right? It's not, it's not floating point. And so we're getting a lot of input that people want this basic to be floating point. And like we're begging laws, please, please make this floating point. Who's we? How many people are in Apple? Well, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're begging laws to make this floating point. And he, he just never does it, you know, and he wrote it by hand on paper. I mean, you know, he didn't, we, he didn't have an assembler or anything to write it with. It was all just written on paper, and he'd type it in. He just never got around to making a Why? floating point. Why? Well, this is one of the mysteries of life. I don't know. <laughs> but he never did. And so, you know, Microsoft had this very popular, really good floating point basic that we ended up going to them and saying, help. And, and, and how much was the, I think you were telling us earlier? Oh, it was $31,000. That Apple uh, paid you for For that. the floating point basic. And I flew out to Apple. I spent two days there getting the cassette. The cassette tapes were the main ways that people stored things at the time. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, that was fun. I think the most fun uh, is, is later uh, when we worked together. Well, what was the most fun? Tell, tell the story about the most fun that was later. And maybe later, not the most fun. <laughs> Let him, let him talk. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Well, you know, Steve can probably uh, start it better. The, the team that was assembled there to do the Macintosh was a very committed team. And there was an equivalent team on our side that just got totally focused on this activity. Jeff Harbour a lot of uh, incredible people. And we really had bet our future um, because we, on the Macintosh being successful, and then hopefully graphics interface in general being successful, but first and foremost, the thing that would popularize that being the Macintosh. And so we were working together, the schedules were uncertain, the quality was uncertain, the price. When Steve first came up, it was gonna be a lot cheaper computer uh, than it ended up being, but that was fine. Uh, <laughs> so you worked in both places, in both? 
Well, we, we were in Seattle, and we right. fly down there. But Microsoft, if I remember correctly uh, from what I read, uh, wasn't Microsoft one of the few companies that were allowed to even have a prototype of the yeah. Mac at the time? Yeah. Well, what's interesting, what, what, what's hard to remember now is that Microsoft wasn't in the applications business then. The Mac, they took a big bet on the Mac because they, this is how they got into the apps business. I mean, Lotus dominated the apps business on the PC back then. Right. We had done just multi-plan, yeah. which was a hit on the Apple II. And then Mitch did an incredible job betting on the IBM PC, and one, two, three came in and, you know, ruled that that part of the business. So the question was, what was the next paradigm shift right. that would allow for an entry? Word Perfect, we had Word, but Word Perfect was by far the strongest in word processing, DBase, and database. And Word was a, that was a kind of a DOS, a text. All of the, all of these products I'm saying were DOS-based right. products, because Windows wasn't in the picture at the time. Right. That's more in the early '90s that that we get to that. And so we made this bet that the parent time shift would be uh, graphics interface, and in particular that the Macintosh would make that happen with 128K of memory, 22K of which was for the screen buffer, uh, 14K was for the operating system. So it was... Uh, 14K. Yeah. 14K. Yeah. The original Mac operating system was 14K. 14K that uh, we had to have loaded when our software ran. So when the shell would come up, it had all the 128K. The OS was, the OS was bigger than 14K. It was in the 20s somewhere. <laughs> I see. So when we ship these, no, we ship these computers now with, you know, a gigabyte, two gigabytes of memory. And, and nobody remembers. 128K. I remember that. I remember, I remember paying a lot of money for computers with 128K in those days. So um, the two companies worked closely on the, on the Mac project because you were maybe not the only, but the principal or one of the principal software creators for it, right? Is that right? Well, Apple did the Mac itself, but we got, we got Bill and his team involved to write these applications. And we were doing a few apps ourselves. We did Mac Paint and Mac Draw and stuff like that. But uh, Bill and his team did some great work. Now, in terms of going, moving forward when, after you left and your company grew more and more strong, how did you, what did you think was going to happen to Apple after sort of the disasters that occurred after Steve left? Well, Apple's fate hung in the balance. Uh, we continued to do Macintosh software and, uh, you know, Excel, which Steve and I introduced together in New York City. Uh, uh, that was kind of a, a fun event. That went on and did very well. Uh, but then, you know, Ma Apple just wasn't differentiating itself well enough from uh, the higher volume platform. And, uh, Meaning Windows, right? I mean... DOS and Windows. I, okay, but especially Windows in the 90s began to take off. By 1995, Windows became popular. The big debate wasn't sort of Mac versus Windows. The big debate was character mode interface versus graphics mode interface. And when the 386 came and we got more memory and the speed was adequate and some development tools came along, that paradigm bet on GUI paid off for everybody who'd gotten in early and said, you know, this is the way that's going to go. Uh, and but so Apple we, wasn't able to leverage its They weren't. You, they, they, after the 512K Mac was done, the product line just didn't evolve uh, as fast. Uh, Steve wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> uh, as it needed to. And we were actually negotiating a deal to invest and, and make some commitments and things with Gil Emilio. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And Don't we were, be mean. Don't be mean to him. I'm sorry? <laughs> just saying the word Gil Emilio. You can see him. Just... Uh, and so I was calling him up on the weekend and all this stuff. And next thing I knew, Steve called me up and said, don't worry about that negotiation with Gil Emilio. Uh, uh, you can just talk to me now. And I said, wow. <laughs> Gil, Gil was a nice guy, but he had a saying. He said... Um, Apple is like a ship with a hole in the bottom, leaking water. And my job is to get the ship pointed in the right direction. So, and meanwhile, uh, through all this, uh, I, I mean, I want to get back to the Thing we saw in 1997 uh, at Macworld there, but uh, uh, 
Windows was just going great guns. I mean, uh, uh, Windows 95, to whatever extent earlier versions of Windows had not had all the features, all the GUI stuff that the Mac had, Windows 95 really was an enormous, enormous leap. Yeah, uh, Windows 95 is when graphics interface became mainstream and when the software industry realized, wow, this is the way applications are going to be done. It, and it was amazing that it was ridiculed sort of in 93, 94. It was not mainstream. And then in 95, the debate was over. Uh, it was kind of just a common sense thing. And it was a combination of hardware and software uh, maturity getting to a, a point that people could see it. Um, so I don't want to go through every detail, the whole history of how you came back, but thank you. You had, <laughs> yeah. but you in that video we all saw, you said you had decided to that it was destructive to have this we competition with Microsoft. Now, obviously, Apple was in a lot of trouble, and I presume that there was some uh, tactical or strategic reason for that, as well as just wanting to be a nice guy, right? I mean, you know, uh, Apple was in in very serious trouble, and. Um, what was really clear was that if the game was a zero-sum game where for Apple to win, Microsoft had to lose, then Apple was going to lose. But that's, a lot of people's heads were still in that place. Why was that from your perspective? Well, a lot of people's heads were in that place at Apple mm -hmm. uh, and, and even in the customer base because, you know, Apple had invented a lot of this stuff and Microsoft was being successful and Apple wasn't and there was jealousy and this and that. There was just a lot of reasons for it that don't matter. But the net result of it was, was there were too many people at Apple and in the Apple ecosystem playing the game of, for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. And it was clear that you didn't have to play that game, because Apple wasn't going to beat Microsoft. Apple didn't have to beat Microsoft. Apple had to remember who Apple was, because it had forgotten who Apple was. And uh, so uh, to me, it was pretty essential to break that paradigm. And it was, it was also important that you know Microsoft was was the biggest software developer outside of Apple developing for the Mac. And, and so, you know, that was, it was just crazy what was happening at that time. And Apple was very weak. And uh, so I called Bill up, and we tried to patch things up. And since that time, we've had a team that's fairly dedicated to doing the Mac applications. And they've always been treated kind of in a unique way so that they can have a pretty special relationship with Apple. And that's worked out very well. In fact, Every couple years or so, there's been something new that we've been able to do on the Mac, and uh, we have a great, it's a great business for us. And, uh, and it's actually the relationship between the Mac development team at, at, at Microsoft and Apple is a great relationship. It's one of our best developer relationships. And do you so. look at yourself as rivals now today as, as this landscape has evolved? And we'll talk about the internet landscape and everything else and other companies that have come forward. But how do you look at yourselves? in this landscape today. Because you, I mean, you, you are competitors uh, in certain ways, which we watch is commercials. the American way, we right? We watch the commercials. And, and you get annoyed at each other from Although time you know to what? time. I have to confess, I like PC Guy better. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> I like him. The you know, the, 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 art of those, those. the art of those yes, commercials sir. is not to be mean, but it's actually for the guys to like each other. <laughs> 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 Thanks. <laughs> PC guy is PC guy is great. I, I like. He's got a big heart. <laughs> His mother loves him. His mother loves I'm him. I'm telling you. Loves him. I, like, um, I like PC guy totally much better. Wow. I do. I don't know why. He's endearing. The other guys. PC are guy is what makes it all work. Actually. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's worth thinking about. So how do you look uh, at yourselves? I mean, uh, uh, let me just ask you, Bill. Uh, you, uh, obviously, Microsoft is a much larger company. You're in many more markets, many more types of products than, than Apple is. Um, you know, when you were uh, running the company or when Steve Ballmer uh, is running the company, uh, you think, obviously, about Google. You think about, I don't know, Linux in the, in the, uh, in the enterprise. You think about uh, lots of, uh, I mean, Sony with, in, in the game uh, area. Um, how often is Apple on your radar screen at Microsoft in a business sense? Well, they're, they're on the radar screen as an opportunity. And in, in a few cases like the Zune, that, if you go over to that group, they think of Apple as a competitor. They love the fact that Apple's created a gigantic market, and they're going to try and come in and, and contribute something to that. that uh, <laughs> and, and we love them because they're all customers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I, I have to tell you, I was actually told by Jay Allard, I'm serious, that because of the nature of the processor, the development platform they used to develop a lot of the software for the Xbox 360 was Max. And he claimed that at one point they had like, placed the biggest order for whatever the Mac Tower was at the time of anybody, and it was Microsoft. I don't know if it was the biggest, but yeah, we had a, the same processor, essentially, that the Mac had. This is one of those great ironies. Is, uh, they were switching away from that processor while the Xbox 360 was adopting it, but for good reasons, actually, in both cases because uh, we're not in a portable application, and that was one of the things that that processor roadmap didn't have. But yes, we did. It shows pragmatism, but uh, we, we try and, uh, and do things that way. Uh, so that was the development system for the early people getting their software ready for the introduction of, of Xbox 360. And we never ran an ad on that. <laughs> I see. How, Admirable restraint. How That's you, wonderful. There restraint. were hundreds of them. Steve is so known for his restraint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Wait, wait, wait. So how do you look at, at Microsoft from an Apple perspective? I mean, you compete in computers and... I mean, you positive. could say you don't compete, you know, the era of destructive whatever, that, whatever you said in 1997, but you think, you're, you're consciously aware of what they're doing with, with you know, Windows. You followed Vista closely, I think. You what's, know? what's really interesting is, um, and, and we talked about this earlier today, if you, if you look at the reason that um, the iPod exists, and that Apple's in that marketplace. Um, it's because these really great Japanese consumer electronics companies who kind of owned the portable music market uh, for a long, long, invented it and owned it, uh, couldn't write, so couldn't do the appropriate software. Couldn't conceive of and implement the appropriate software. Because an iPod's really just software. It's software in the iPod itself, it's software on the PC or the Mac, and it's software in the cloud for the store. And it's in a beautiful box, but it's software. Um, if you look at what a Mac is, uh, it's, it's OS X, right? It's in a beautiful box, but it's, it's OS X. And if you look at what an iPhone will hopefully be, it's software. And so the, the, the big secret about Apple, of course, not so big secret maybe, is that Apple views itself as a software company. And there aren't very many software companies left. And Microsoft is a software company. And so, you know, we, we look at what they do and, and, and we think some of it's really great. We think some of it's, a little bit of it's competitive and most of it's not. You know, we, we don't have a belief that the Mac is going to take over 80% of the PC market. You know, we, we're really happy when our market share goes up a point. Uh, and we love that and we work real hard at it. But Apple's fundamentally a software company and there's not a lot of us left and Microsoft's one. But you, you may be fundamentally a software company, but you've been known, at least to your customers and to most journalists, as the company that kind of pays a lot of attention to integrating software and hardware. You know, Alan Microsoft has made some recent moves mm -hmm. to be a little more like that, obviously not in your core biggest businesses, but with Xbox and Zune and you know, the Surface Computing uh, a device we saw today is another example. These aren't markets that hold up in size to Windows or Office, but there are some of your more recent initiatives. Are, are the company's approaches to this Alan Kay had urging a, great, a little? Or? Alan Kay had a great quote back in the 70s, I think. He said, uh, people that love software want to do their own hardware. You know? Well, Bill loves software. No, yeah. I can resist that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the question is, are there markets where the innovation and variety you get is a net positive. The negative is that in the early stage, you really want to do the two together. So you want to do prototyping and things like that, uh, you know, really is one thing. And then to take the phone market, uh, we think we're on 140 different kinds of hardware. We think it's beneficial to us that even if we did a few ourselves, it wouldn't give us what we have through those partnerships. Likewise, if you take the robotics market, very undeveloped, we have over 140 all tiny volume robots using Microsoft software and the creativity building toys, security things, medical things. We love the innovation and the ecosystem that's going to grow up, who knows when, but we're patient around that and we'll have a, a great asset with this robotic software platform. So there are things like PC, phone, and robot where I it, it, the Microsoft choice, 
uh, is to go for the variety. It's apples. It's great. They're you know for them they do what works super well for them. And there's a few markets like Xbox 360, Zune, and this year we have two new ones: the Surface thing and this round table, which is the meeting room thing, where we'll actually uh, through subcontractors, but it's our the P&L on the risk and all that for the hardware, the design is, is completely a Microsoft thing. The, the, the round table, is that something you've announced or were you just... Uh, we've shown it? prototypes of it. It's, that's the thing where it's got the 360 degree cameras all right. and all those... It's like Cisco has something in that market and HP too, right? Or well, HP has a very high-end thing uh, that's a tiny bit like it. But anyway... Uh, all right. <laughs> you know, Do you ever regret... It, was there something you might have wanted to do differently? And maybe this all, you feel like this happened after you left Apple. Uh, uh, something you might have done differently that were, where you could have had a much bigger market share for the Mac? Uh, well, before I answer that, let me make a comment on Bill's answer there, which is it's very interesting in the consumer market um, and the enterprise market, they're, they're very different spaces. And in the consumer market, at least, I think one can make a pretty strong case that outside of Windows uh, on PCs, it's hard to see other examples of, of, of the software and hardware being decoupled working super well yet. It might in the phone space over time. It might. Um, but it's not clear. It's not clear. Uh, you can see a lot more examples of the hardware-software coupling working well. And so I think this is, this is uh, one of the reasons we all you know, come to work every day is because nobody knows the answer to some of these questions, and we'll find out over the coming years. Maybe both will work fine, yeah, and I think, maybe they won't. Yeah, it's good, in the, it's good to try both approaches. In some product categories, take music players, this, the solo design worked better. In the PC market, uh, the, the variety of designs uh, at this stage has a higher share. It has a higher share? Yeah, it has a lot higher share. Well, it's not that much different music players the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, do, is there some moment you feel like, I should have done this, or Apple should have done that, and we could have had? Oh, you uh, stuck if not, to this idea of these hardware-software integration, and it's working very well now. There, there's a lot of things that happened uh, that I'm sure I could have done better when I was at Apple the first time, and a lot of things that happened after I left that I thought were wrong turns, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter, and you kind of got to let go of that stuff, and, uh, you know, we are where we are. So we tend to look forward, and, you know, one of the things I did when I got back to Apple 10 years ago was I, I, I gave the museum to Stanford and all the papers and all the old machines and kind of cleared out the cobwebs and said, let's stop looking backwards here. It's all about what happens tomorrow. And because you can't, you can't look back and say, well, gosh, you know, I wish I hadn't gotten fired. I wish I was there. I wish this. I wish that. It doesn't matter. And so let's go invent tomorrow rather than worrying about what happened right, let's, yesterday. Let's talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about tomorrow, but let's talk about today, the landscape of how you see the different players in the market and how you, you look at what's developing now. What has surprised both of you since having been around for so long and still very active in everything? I mean, your companies are still critically key companies, but there are many, many companies that are becoming quite powerful. How do you look at the landscape at this moment and what's happening, especially in the internet space? I think it's super healthy right now. I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, young people out there building some great companies who want to build companies, who aren't just interested in starting something and selling it to one of the big guys, but who want to build companies. And uh, I think there's some, some really exciting companies getting built out there, some next generation of stuff that, that uh, you know, some of us play catch up with and and, you know, some of us find ways to partner with and things like that. But there's a lot of activity out there now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I'd say it's a healthy period. Yeah. The, the notion of what the new form factors look like, uh, what natural interface can do, the ability to use the cloud, the Internet, to do part of the task uh, in a complementary way to the, the local experience. There's a lot of invention that uh, the whole approach of startups, the existing companies who do research, uh, it, it, we'll look back at this as one of the, the great periods of invention. I think so too. There's a lot of things that, 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 are, that are risky, 
right now, which is always a good sign, you know, and you can see through them. You can see to the other side and go, yes, this could be huge, but there's a period of risk that, you know, nobody's ever done it before. And, Give an and example that would, for example, I, I do, but I can't say. Okay. And so, but, but I can say, when you feel like that, that's a great thing. Right. That's what keeps you coming to work in the morning, and, it's right. an, and it tells you there's something exciting around the next corner. Okay, but, so the two of you have... Uh, certainly, uh, you're, you're involved every day with the internet. You have internet products. Uh, you have a whole slew of stuff on the internet. Uh, y you have iTunes and .Mac and, 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 and all of that. But on another level, you're the guys who represent the rich client, the personal computer, the you know, big uh, uh, operating system and all that. And there is a certain school of thought and I'm sure it's shared by some people in the room, that this is all migrating to the cloud and you'll need a fairly light piece of hardware uh, that won't have to have all that uh, investment, all the kind of stuff you guys have done uh, throughout your careers. Um, so as much as people might think of you as rivals, one way to think of you is the two guys. They were both dinosaurs. Huh? They were both dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, yeah, whatever. I, I, I can talk about that? No. Um, seriously, um, is You're there in five years, in five years is the personal computer is still going to be the linchpin of all this stuff? Well, you can say that it'll be predicted that it won't be. Uh, you know, the network computer uh, took us over about, what, five years ago we disappeared. Uh, <laughs> remember the single function computer? There was somebody who said that the, these general purpose things are kind Very of a awesome. dumb idea. Uh, so this, that took us over. The mainstream is always under attack. The thing that people don't realize is that you're going to have rich local functionality, I mean, at least our bet, whereas you get things like speech and vision, as you get more natural form factors, it's a question of using that local richness together with uh, the richness that's, that's elsewhere. And if, if you look at the device, say, that's connecting to the TV set or connecting in the car, there are lighter weight hardware uh, internet connections, but when you come to the full screen, rich, you know, edit the document, create things, uh, you know, I think we're nowhere near where we can be on making that stronger. I'll give you a concrete example. Um, I love Google Maps, use it on my computer, you know, in a browser, uh, but when we were doing the iPhone, we thought, wouldn't it be great to have Maps on the iPhone? And so uh, we called up Google, and uh, they had some, they'd done a few client apps in Java on some phones, and they yep. had a, an API that we worked with them a little on. And uh, we ended up writing a client app for those APIs. They would provide the back-end service. And the app we were able to write, since we're pretty reasonable at writing apps, uh, blows away any Google Maps client. Just blows it away. Same set of data coming off the server, but the experience you have using it is unbelievable. It's way better than the computer. And, uh, and, and just in a completely different league than what they'd put on phones before. And, you know, that client is, is the result of a lot of technology on the client, that client application. So when we show it to them, they're, they're just blown away by how good it is. And you can't do that stuff in a browser. So people are figuring out how to do more in a browser, how to get persistent state of things when you're disconnected from a browser, how do you actually run apps locally using you know, apps written in those technologies so they can be pretty transparent whether you're connected or not. But it's happening fairly slowly, and there's still a lot you can do with a, 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 a rich client environment. At the same time, the hardware is progressing to where you can run a rich client environment on lower and lower cost devices on lower and lower power devices. And so uh, there are some pretty cool things you can do with clients. So are you, okay, so you're saying <clears throat> rich clients still matter, but maybe I misunderstood you, but I, your example was about a rich client that is not a personal computer as we have thought of a personal what computer. What I'm trying to say is it's, I think the marriage of some really great client apps with some really great cloud services is incredibly powerful and right now can be way more powerful than just having a browser on the client. You're talking about a yeah. software company being a software and services company rather than a... I'm saying the marriage of these services plus a more sophisticated client is a very powerful marriage. Bill, you're yeah, architecturally, the, qu the question is do you run just in the cloud and all you have down locally is the browser? And it, that is the same question for the phone as it is for the full screen device. There will always be different screen sizes because these are, you know, the, eight, the, the five inch screen does not really compete with the 
20-inch screen does not compete with the big living room screen. Those are uh, things that there'll be some type of computing behind all of those things, all connected to the Internet. But the idea that locally you have the responsiveness of immediate interaction without the latency or bandwidth limitations that you get if you try and do it all, uh, all behind, uh, you know, what that, that that's what leads to the, the right balance. What does that device look like in five years? What would you be your principal device? Is there one or? Is it, a, is it a, I think you use, I could be wrong, I think you carry a tablet. Right. Right. right which has not necessarily stormed the world yet. Yeah, this is like Windows 1992, uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> that is, I'm unrepentant un, uh, on uh, my belief. In, okay, uh, but to go back to Kara's point, what would you each imagine that you would carry as your principal, let's say, thing to do I mean, the Jeff web Hawkins and showed a very light email and all that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you, I don't know if you guys saw, but Jeff Hawkins showed a Linux-based, a very small... Uh, he called, I think he called oh, it a companion yeah, to yeah. a smartphone today. A phone companion, which sounded yeah. a little naughty, frankly. It, it doesn't matter, you weren't there, but um, what would you think you got each would be, I assume you carry, uh, you, you carry a tablet PC, I don't know what brand it is, maybe you change them up, I, I don't know. You obviously carry a MacBook Pro, I would guess, or a MacBook. Yeah, well, and an iPhone. And an iPhone. You have one? I do. Right here? Yes. Well, he has when he took it out before. Um, what? Uh, really? He Sorry, flashed his say. iPhone earlier today. Anyway, go ahead. So, what is your device? What do what, you? What, what do you uh, device what's your device in five carrying? years that you rely on the most? I don't think you'll have one device. I think you'll have a full screen device that you can carry around, and you'll do dramatically more reading Light. off Light. of that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I believe in the tablet form factor. I think you'll have voice, I think you'll have ink, you'll have some way of having a hardware keyboard and some settings for that. And then you'll have the device that fits in your pocket, which the whole notion of how much function, how much function should you combine in there, you know, there's navigation computers, there's media, there's phone. Uh, technology is letting us put more things in there, but then again, you really want to tune it so people know what they expect. So there's quite a bit of experimentation in that pocket size device. But I think those are natural form factors and that we'll have the evolution of the portable machine and the evolution of the phone will both be extremely high volume complementary. That is, if you own one, you're more likely to own the other. And then at home you'd have a, a setup that they all plug into? Well, at home you'll have your living room, which is your 10 foot experience and that's connected up to the internet. Uh, and there you'll have gaming and entertainment and there's a lot of experimentation in terms of what content looks like in that world. Um, and then in your den, you'll have something a lot like you have at your desk at work. You know, the view is that every horizontal and vertical surface will have a projector uh, so you can put information. You know, your desk can be a surface that you can sit and manipulate things. Can I please have a room in my house that doesn't have a screen and a projector in it? You bet. Thanks. The bathroom. <laughs> well, That's right. the perfect place for it, actually. <laughs> so what's your five-year outlook at the devices you'll carry? You know, it's interesting. The PC has proved to be very resilient. Because as Bill said earlier, I mean, the death of the PC has been predicted every few years. And here, when you're saying PC, you mean personal computer in general, not just Windows PCs. I mean personal computer yeah. in general. Okay. And, and uh, you know, there was the age of productivity, if you will, you know, the spreadsheets and word processors, and that kind of got the whole industry moving. And it, it kind of plateaued for a while, was getting a little stale, and then the Internet came along, right? And uh, everybody needed more powerful computers to get on the Internet. Browsers came along, and it was this whole Internet age that came along, access to the Internet. And, and then some number of years ago, you could start to see that the PC, that was taken for granted, things had kind of plateaued a little bit and innovation-wise at least. And then I, I think this whole notion of the PC, we called it the digital hub, but you can call it anything you want, sort of the multimedia center of the house, started to take off with digital cameras and digital camcorders and sharing things over the Internet and kind of needing a repository for all that stuff. And it was reborn again as sort of the hub of your digital life. And you can sort of see that there's something starting again. It's not clear exactly what it is, but... It will be the PC maybe used a little more tightly coupled with some back-end Internet services and some things like that. And, of course, PCs are going mobile in an ever greater degree. So I think the PC is going to continue. This general-purpose device is going to continue to 
be with us and morph with us, whether it's a tablet or a notebook or a you know, big curved desktop that you have at your house or whatever it might be. So I think that'll be something that most people have, at least in this society and others maybe not, but certainly in this one. But then there's an explosion uh, that's starting to happen in these, what, what you call post-PC devices, right? And you call the iPod one of them. Uh, there's a lot of things that are not... And get into trouble for using that term. I want you to know that. What? what? I'm kidding. Post-PC devices. Why? Uh, people, people write letters to the editor. They complain about it. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, I think there's just a category of devices that aren't as general purpose, uh, that aren't... That, that are they're really more focused on specific functions, whether they're phones or iPods or Zooms or what have you. And I think the, that category of devices is starting, is going to continue to be very innovative, and we're going to see lots of them. Give me an, an example of what it, would that would be. Well, an iPod, iPod. is a post-PC well, yeah. device. A phone is a post-PC device. The, is the iPhone and are some of these other smartphones, and I know you make... Uh, you believe that the iPhone is much better than these other smartphones at the moment, but is the, are these things, aren't they really just computers in a different form factor? I mean, when you say we well, use the word the phone, where, it sounds like... We're getting to the point where everything's a computer in a different form factor. So, so what? Right? So what if it's built with a computer inside it? It doesn't matter. It's what is it? How do you use it? You know, how does the consumer approach it? And, uh, and so who cares what's inside it anymore? So what are the core functions of the device formerly known as the cell phone, whatever we want to call it, the pocket device? What would you say the core functions? Like five years out, what are the core functions of that pocket device? How quickly all these things that have been somewhat specialized, the navigation device, the digital wallet, the, the phone, the camera, the video camera, how quickly those all come together it's hard to chart out, but eventually you'll be able to make something that has the capability to do every one of those things. And yet, given the small size, you still won't want to edit your homework or edit a movie on the screen of that size. Uh, and so you'll have something else that lets you do the reading and editing and, and those things. Now, if we could ever get a screen that would just roll out like a scroll, you know, then uh, you might be able to have the device that did everything. Well, so you know, in the very first D conference, we had these guys from E Inc. here. Yeah. I'm sure you've both talked to them. Uh, they were talking about that. That was five years ago. It's always five years yeah. out. Do you? Do you? Yes, yeah, so we can't. The, there's some advances in projection technology that are more likely to deliver it, I think, than the flexible material guys. But it's not even on the horizon, no matter which of the two approaches. Uh, our we have some Microsoft research people who work on that. And there's, there's a lot of investment, but it's at least in the five-year time frame. You, five years from now, what's going to be on that, that pocket phone. device? I don't know. Um, and the reason I don't know is because I wouldn't have thought that there would have been maps on it five years ago. But something comes along, gets really popular, people love it, get used to it, you want it on there. Uh, so people are inventing things constantly, and I think the art of it is, 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 is balancing what's on there and what's not on there, is the editing function. And um, clearly, most things you carry with you are communications devices. You want to do some entertainment with them as well, but they're primarily communications devices, and they're gonna, that's what they're going to be. Outside of the computing area, what are the exciting areas in the internet space at all that you're looking at that you find that's interesting to each of your companies and in general for, for you? Any kind of social networking, any kind of the wikis, those kind of things, things we've talked about in the past couple of, I mean, today, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're working on some things that I can't talk about. Again. But Again, yeah, but there used very to be, beautiful. There I used know. to be a saying, isn't it at Apple? Gotta blow us away, though. Blow us when away. You can't talk. Wow, it's great. There used to be a saying at Apple, isn't it funny a ship that leaks from the top? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, that's, that's kind of like a sweater without sleeves is a vest. I don't get that. That was what they used to say about me when I was in my twenties. <laughs> okay. Uh, the. Um, there's a zillion interesting things going on on the internet. The, the most interesting things to me are these incredible new services that people are bringing up. 
And, um, Surrounding entertainment or? Uh, there's a lot of them surrounding entertainment, but there's a lot of them that have to do with just sort of figuring out how to navigate through life a little more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, you know, it's really great when you show somebody something and you don't have to convince them they have a problem that this solves. They know they have a problem. You can show them something. They go, oh, my God, mm -hmm. I need this. And I think you're going to see a lot of things like that happen over the next year or two. Do you, uh, you obviously have a very large Internet business with iTunes, mm -hmm. and, and you sell a lot of stuff on the, uh, in the Apple store. But, you know, you were early with this idea that when you bought a, a computer from Apple, you had this kind of Internet service back end, and it was called .Mac. Mm -hmm. And... I think a lot of people feel it. you haven't developed it very much. I couldn't agree with you more, and we'll make up for lost time in the near future. And in, and in your case, you obviously have huge things like, uh, like Hotmail, for instance, which is, uh, I guess, it, 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 and, and Windows Messenger, which are both uh, widely used, and I don't even know how many users. A gazillion. Huge okay. numbers. But on the other hand, you haven't, uh, as, as Steve Ballmer was talking about today, you know, you have other people have much stronger positions in things like search and uh, 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 other parts of the, uh, of the Internet. So it, are you guys, because you are uh, uh, the personal computer companies that, that are best, uh, you know, best associated with that, not as nimble as some of these competitors at this point? Do you worry about not being as nimble, both of you? I mean, obviously, Microsoft's a much bigger company, but you're a big company. Uh, Steve, uh, Apple is. Do, do you worry about not being as nimble as somebody sitting out there with, you know, the kind of 10 employees that you guys had in 1977? Well, there's always going to be great new things that come out of other companies, and you want to be in a position to benefit from those, to have those inventions drive demand for Windows and personal computers, and then some of those upstream things you want to participate in. Uh, I hope Steve mentioned we are going to participate in search, hopefully to a higher degree in the future. He did mention that, uh, yeah. Than at present, so we'll, we'll see what we can do there. A lot of the applications are more specialized, so they're not areas we'll go into. You know, take what can happen with education now that video is mainstream and all these tools that let you do rich interactions are very mainstream. I'm very excited about that. You know, the idea of empowerment goes back to the very beginning of our industry and some of those dreams that this would be used by students or that teachers could get better and learn from each other in these new ways. We've ju we're just at the threshold where some of those things can happen. And yes, our companies uh, can contribute to that, but as a whole, it's the ecosystem jumping on and building on each other where you can finally say, finally, technology did something for education. See, I, I look at this a little bit differently, which is uh, we're not trying to do a lot of this stuff because it's not what we do. We don't think one company can do everything. So you've got to partner with people that are really good at stuff. Like, we're not, I mean, maybe Microsoft is, is great at search. We're not. We're not trying to be great at search. So we partner with people that are great at search. And uh, we don't know how to do maps on the back end. We know how to do a great, the best maps client in the world, but we don't know how to do the back end. So we partner with people that know how to do the back end. And what we want to do is be that uh, that consumer's device and that consumer's experience wrapped around all this information and, and, and things we can deliver to them in a wonderful user interface, in a coherent product. And so in some cases, you know, we have to do more work than others. You know, in the case of, of, of iTunes, there wasn't a music delivery service that was any good, and we had to do one, so we'll do one. But in other cases, there's companies doing a way better job because we're not as, as good at this stuff as other people are, and we'd love to partner with them. And so, you know, we selectively do that. And um, I think it's... It's really hard for one company to do everything. Let's talk about entertainment. Life's You're both in, entertain in the entertain world. Entertainment is important to both your companies for yours. Music right now, and as you get into I Apple TV, Microsoft has been within the Hollywood area. Where do you see that going in the era of YouTube? We've had a couple of network people here um, talking about changes that are happening in Hollywood and everything else. What is happening now to entertainment delivery, and where do you all play? Because you'll be the delivery mechanism in one way or the other for most people. Well, the big, the big milestone is where the delivery platform is the Internet. And so you bring the richness and the interactivity. I think you can get a little bit of a glimpse of the future of TV more from looking at 
community type things like Xbox Live, where people are talking to each other, finding friends, you know, watching things together, talking about those things. That, as you map that onto genres like uh, educational shows or sports shows or watching the Olympics or the elections, uh, that ability to navigate becomes very, very powerful. And we're not an entertainment company. Yes, we do Halo, which is this big video game. But by and large, we're a platform. And so it's the, it's the tough software things, whether it's the speech or the ink or the deep graphics. That's where things that take 10 years to get done, the IPTV stuff, the foundation there. You know, it took 10 years to get it done. Now it's finally uh, coming to fruition. And we have people like uh, AT&T betting uh, their company on uh, putting that together. So we're just at the start of having a, a scale uh, entertainment delivery vehicle, uh, through, both through PCs, unfortunately not connected up to the TV set in most cases, but uh, that's a point of innovation. And now things uh, like IPTV and, and Xbox that are connected up in the living room. Steve, you were today, uh, uh, Bill, you weren't here, but Steve showed a uh, uh, a new function of Apple TV that brings YouTube directly to the TV. Uh, is there going to be more of that from you? Do you, do you see yourself, as, uh, the way Bill says, as an enabler of entertainment? Or, well, I mean, putting aside your Disney role, but your yeah, Apple. I mean, I think, I think people want to enjoy their entertainment when they want it and how they want it, on the device that they want it on. So ultimately, uh, that's going to drive the entertainment companies into all sorts of different business models. And that's a good thing. I mean, if you're a content company, that's a great thing. More people wanting to you know, enjoy your content more often in more different ways, that's, that's why you're in business. But the transitions are hard sometimes. And you know, the music industry, it turned out that the internet got fast enough to download songs pretty easily. There was no legal alternatives, and, and maybe they made some bad choices in how they reacted to that. But you know, they're still trying to make the transition to a, a, a very different way of doing business or ways of doing business while they're under attack from piracy. And we can all highlight some of the mistakes that have been made, but you know, still, it's a tough job. And uh, Hollywood, I think, uh, you know, has, has watched what's happened in music, learned some things to do, some things not to do. But you know, they're still trying to map this out. How do they make some of these transitions, some new business models, different platforms, allowing their, their customers way more freedom on when they want to watch stuff and how they want to watch it. And I think there's a tremendous amount of experimentation and thought going on that's going to be good, that's going to be really good, if you're a content owner. Can I ask about uh, the user interface of the personal computer for a minute? Um, uh, Vista has just come out, uh, which is your best version of Windows uh, you've done, has some UI uh, improvements in it. Uh, you're about to do uh, yet another version of uh, the Mac OS called Leopard in the, in the fall, which from what you've shown publicly at least so far has, a, has some improvements. But fundamentally, these are still the kind of file icon, folder icon, uh, drop-down menu. I know I'm minimizing. There's a lot of other things. There's gadgets and widgets and all, all kinds of other cool things in there now. But it, you, know, there, you can see that it's still all built on uh, what you started with, what Xerox uh, did research on. Is there a, in the offing in the next four or five years, is it possible there's a new paradigm for organizing the user interface of the personal computer? Let's leave cell phones and things out for a minute, but just the personal computer, uh, Bill. One of the things that's been anticipated for a long time is when 3D comes into that interface. And there was a lot of experimentation, sites on the internet where you'd kind of walk around and meet people. But in fact, the richness, the speed, it just didn't sustain itself. Now we're starting to see with some of the mapping stuff, a few of the sites, that the quality of that graphics, the tools and things are getting to the point where 3D can really come in. So I definitely say that when you go to a store, a uh, bookstore, you'll be able to see the books lined up you know, the way you might be interested in or lined up the way they are in the real store. So 3D is a way of organizing things, particularly as we're getting much more uh, media information on the computer, a lot more choices, a lot more navigation than we've ever had before. And we can take that into this communications world where the PC is playing a much more central role, kind of taking over 
what the, was the PBX, sort of one of the last mainframes in the business environment. Uh, that'll be a big change uh, that'll come to it. And as we get natural input, uh, that'll cause a change. And, to and what about this multi-touch stuff? It, it's really interesting. <clears throat> Uh, obviously, Steve showed some of it on the on the iPhone when he introduced uh, the iPhone. Steve Ballmer today showed a bunch of it with the Surface computing device. It happens, although it's not part of our program, that HP, which is a sponsor of this conference, has a multi-touch sort of display uh, uh, over here uh, out in the foyer. Um, is this... Will this make its sort way of that minority into, report, this kind of thing? Yeah, will this make its way into, maybe you call it direct manipulation of objects with your hands and your fingers. Will this make its way into mainstream, let's say, laptop computers as a new UI or an additional part of the UI? Or is that just a well, but go beyond the specialized laptop. devices? Vis vision, software is doing vision. And so, you know, imagine a game machine where you just can pick up the bat and swing it, or the tennis racket and oh, swing it. Yeah, we have one of those. We. No, no, that's, well, the, that's the not it. You can't pick up your tennis oh, racket oh, I see what you mean. and yeah. swing it. Right. You can't sit there with your friends and do those natural things. That's a 3D positional device. This is video recognition. This is a camera seeing what's going on. And, you know, in a meeting, like you're on a video, con uh, video conference, you don't know who's speaking, when they're, they're audio only, things like that. The camera will be ubiquitous. Now, of course, we have to design it in a way that people's expectations about privacy are handled appropriately. But software can do vision, and it can do it very, very inexpensively. And that means this stuff becomes pervasive. You don't just talk about it being in a laptop device. You talk about it being part of the meeting room or the living room or... But on the laptop, the way that... Uh, and, and, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is what we have is great, and we don't need any new big radical change, but when I turn on my laptop, whether it's my Vista laptop or my uh, Mac laptop, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, there have been improvements, but it's a lot like it was 10 years ago. It's much better, the graphics are better and all that. You talked about that radical but, change. You know, you have the mouse, for you, both your you have the icons, you move around, you have the, I mean, and you talked about what a big gamble it was in 84 to do that and then follow on with, with Windows. We still essentially have that approach, and I'm just wondering, is that going to change? Touch, ink, speech, vision, uh, those things come in, but they don't come in as a radical substitute. I think you're also underestimating the degree of evolution, uh, okay. because you've lived with it year by year. You know, say we'd sent you away for 10 years, and you came back and you said, wow, there's a search paradigm, and that's more at the center of how you find these things. There's tagging, that's more at the center of how, how you find these things. Uh, there's, you know, the evolution is a very good thing. In fact, even in that evolution, the stuff we did with Office, you, there's this balance you strike where when you make a change, in this, that case the ribbon, you're going to have some users who feel like, oh, geez, I have to spend a little bit time to be brought along uh, to that. Uh, you know, as, but there has been good evolution. But these natural interface things are the revolutionary change, and they'll be very revolutionary. That, together with the 3D that I talked about. Steve, I know you're working on something. It's going to be beautiful. We'll see it soon. Yeah, you yeah, know, I, I can't talk about it, but <laughs> the um, Bill discusses all his secret plans. You don't yeah, discuss any. I know it's not fair, but it's. Um, I think the question of the question is a very simple one, which is. How much of the really revolutionary things people are going to do in the next five years are done on the PCs, or how much of it is really focused on the post-PC devices? And there's a real temptation to focus it on the post-PC devices, because it's a clean slate, and because uh, there are more focused devices, and because they don't, have the, you know, they don't have the legacy of these zillions of apps that have to run in zillions of markets. Uh, and so I think there's going to be tremendous revolution in the, in the, you know, in the experiences of the post-PC devices. And the question is, how much to do in the PCs? And I think, I'm sure Microsoft is, we're working on some really cool stuff. But some of it has to be tempered a little bit because you do have, you know, these tens of millions, in our case, or hundreds of millions, in Bill's case, users that are familiar with something that, you know, they don't want a car with six wheels. They like the car with four wheels. They don't want to drive with a, with, a, with, a, with a joystick. They like the steering wheel. 
And so, you know, you have to, as Bill was saying, in some cases you have to augment what exists there, and in some cases you can replace things. Um, but I think the radical rethinking of things is going to happen in a lot of these post-PC devices. Can I, I, I'm going to ask a more personal question. You, we have a, just a minute before we were going to open up for questions. What's the greatest, I'm not going to call this the Barbara Walters moment and ask you what tree you'd like to be, but... Um, what's she would love to be Barbara would, Walters, let me just tell you. No, I would not. Um, what's the greatest misunderstanding... Ding! ding right. But thank you, Steve. Um, about your relationship. I mean, you're obviously going to go down in history as history books already set kind of thing. But what's the greatest misunderstanding between your and your relationship and about each, uh, each other? What would you say would be this idea of cat fight, this idea of what, what, which one of the many? We've kept our marriage secret for over a decade now. <laughs> <laughs> Canada. That trip to Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was, was there I, do, I don't think either of us have anything to complain about uh, in general and I know that the, the projects like the Mac project you know was just an incredible thing a fun thing uh, where we were taking a risk uh, we did look a lot younger in that video we did uh, you look 12 in the first one. That's how I try and look. It was 12. <laughs> but, no, it's been fun to work together. Uh, and I actually kind of miss some of the people who aren't around anymore. You know, people come and go in this industry. It's nice when somebody sticks around and uh, you know, have some context of all the things that have worked and not worked. And the industry gets all, work, all crazy about some new thing, you know, like... You know, the, the, there's always this paradigm of the company that's successful is going to go away and stuff like that. It's nice to have people seeing the waves and waves of that and yet been willing when it, when it counted to take the risk uh, to bring in something new. Has it been important? One last question and then we'll, uh, we'll go to the audience. Well, no, he I didn't, he an didn't answer us because he I'm just sorry, said what? this. I have an answer. He only oh, talked sorry. about his secret gay okay, marriage. Yeah. So. I thought that was your answer. No, that, that wasn't my answer. You know, when Bill and I first met each other and worked together in the early days, uh, generally we were both the youngest guys in the room, right, individually or together. I'm about six months older than he is, but roughly the same age. And now when we're working at our respective companies, I don't know about you, but I'm the oldest guy in the room most of the time. And um, that's why I love being here. And, <laughs> and, so, happy to oblige. Uh, happy to oblige. And, uh, you know, I think, of, I think of most things in life as either a Bob Dylan or a Beatles song. But there's that, that one line in that one Beatles song, uh, uh, you and I have memories longer than the road that stretches out ahead. And that's, that's clearly true here. Uh, well, you know what? I think we should end it there. Let's just end it there. I'm going to have a little tear right here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, standing O. Thanks. Have we ever had a standing O? Here? No. I don't know. The toilet. No. <laughs> some audience questions. Please. Questions. Can we have the lights? Roger, Roger. Mankin Roger. from Elevation Partners. Hey guys, that was, that was incredible. Thank you very much. We've got a big election coming up next year. I'm curious if there are any issues that you see in Silicon Valley uh, that we all ought to be focused on communicating effectively to the next potential president of the United States. That is any common ground that we share because it's weird. You don't actually hear any issues that people are talking about right now. And I'm curious if you guys have any in mind. Yeah. Well, certainly education is one that uh, I'd put at the top of the list. 
you know, is the are there technological solutions right now that they could do something about, or is that just sort of like the no, the the, pro the edu technology is going to be helpful and more and more, but the way that teachers are measured and, and made excellence, uh, the way that the high schools are designed, the expectations they have, it's, it's not just a pure technology thing. It's more an institutional uh, practice uh, where the opportunity is. And you know, there should be a lot of debate about the different ways of, of doing that. Steve. Boy, we've got some pretty big problems. And uh, I think most of them are much bigger than anything Silicon Valley can contribute right now to solve. So hopefully some of those will get solved. I also think we underestimate how much all of our industry depends on stability. Uh, we've enjoyed a you know, long period of stability, and we've, we've been able to focus on, on technology and growing our businesses and stuff, and, and, and I think we take that for granted sometimes. One of the more interesting areas that we all suffer from, of course, is, is, is in the area of energy dependence. And there's a lot of work going on. I know uh, a lot of investing going on anyway. I don't know if the results are there, but a lot of investing going on in, in alternative energy. And maybe, maybe Silicon Valley can play a small role in some of that stuff. Are you too. guys investing in that area? Personally? Or? Some. Which might be a lot. Okay. You? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> A billion here or there. Steve. <laughs> Are you investing in that area? No. Or just a Prius. Okay. Like yeah, that. just appreciating it. Over there. Hi, Don Eklund, Sony Pictures. Um, my question is really, at what point is there too much diversity? Uh, it, it was talked about a few times in the discussion, the fact that now uh, microprocessors are very low cost, memory is low cost, software is, is ubiquitous. <laughs> But uh, you know, my life has been uh, made better by standards like uh, coding standards, uh, network standards, and it seems like we're reaching a, a point where uh, diversity is starting to, to take hold to a point where we're not going to be able to have the kinds of convergence devices that I think everyone would really be able to appreciate. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, is this going to be like, like health care or mass transit where you just can never put it back in the bottle again? And uh, I'd like to get your perspective on that. If there's still an opportunity to have some grand convergence devices that uh, can really simplify people's lives and, uh, and, and enrich their lives. Steve? Well, I think Bill and I would agree that we can get it down to two. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's a, it's hard to, it's hard to limit imagination and innovation. I think there's always going to be a bunch of new great things. but. And I think that's part of what we put up with to get the innovation. We put up with a little bit of aggravation to get the innovation. And I think the marketplace is awfully good at allowing diversity when it should and then getting rid of it when it shouldn't. I mean, and then letting it come back sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean in terms of standards and, and things. You know, you, there's a, the Internet standards have been incredibly powerful, you know, video formats, things like this. Uh, and so I, I don't see things that are going to really hold back a convergence device. Uh, you know, sure, there's a lot of wireless approaches, but that's pretty healthy right now. They each have various merits. A few of them will end up overlapping the other ones and kill the other ones out. But well, I think the industry's done very well at uh, latching on to standards for the things that there were no longer any innovation in and then focusing on uh, the places where the, it wasn't clear which approach was, was best. Uh, Jesse? Hi, I'm Jesse Kornbluth, headbutler.com. Uh, because you're not the youngest guys in the room anymore, it's perhaps appropriate to ask you a question about legacy, each of you. Uh, Bill, even your harshest critic would have to admit that your philanthropy work is you know, planet-shaking, incredible, and uh, could, could be, if you make it, a second act so amazing that it would dwarf what you've actually done at Microsoft. Um, if you had to choose a legacy, what would it be? And Steve, 
do you look at Bill and you think, gee, that guy is so lucky. He had a company so rich with talent that he didn't have to personally, you know, come in every day and, and save it. And, you know, I wish I had the opportunity. <laughs> Okay, he's not going to answer that one. Bill? Well, the most important work I got a chance to be involved in, uh, no matter what I do, is the personal computer. You know, that's what I grew up, you know, my teens, my 20s, my 30s. Uh, you know, I even knew not to get married because I was so, until later, because I was so obsessed with it. That's my life's work. And I, it's lucky for me that some of the skill skills and resources, uh, but I'd put skills first, that I, I was able to develop through those experiences can be applied uh, to the benefit of uh, the, the people who haven't had technology, including uh, medicine, working for them. So it's an incredible blessing to have two things like that. But the thing that I'll, you know, my, if you look inside my brain, it's filled with software and, you know, <laughs> the magic of software and a belief in software. Uh, and, you know, that, that's not going to change. Okay. So your question was uh, about whether I wish I didn't have to go into Apple every day? <laughs> no, if you, if, if you envy Bill a bit the second act that he has. Oh, no, I think it's, I think the world's, anything else, but. I think the world's a better place because Bill realized that his goal isn't to be the richest guy in the cemetery, right? That's a good thing. And so he's doing a lot of good with the, the money that he made. You know, I'm, I'm sure Bill was, was like me in this way. I mean, I, I grew up fairly middle class, lower middle class, and, and, uh, and I never really cared much about money. And Apple was so successful early on in life that I, I was very lucky that I didn't have to care about money then. And so I've been able to focus on work and then later on my family. And uh, I, I sort of look at us as two of the luckiest guys on the planet because we found what we loved to do and we were at, at the right place at the right time. Uh, and we've gotten to go to work every day with super bright people for 30 years and, and do what we love doing. And so uh, it's hard to be happier than that. You know, your family and that, what more can you ask for? And so I don't think about legacy much. Uh, I just think about being able to get up every day and go in and hang around these great people and hopefully create something that other people will love as much as we do. And if we can do that, that's, that's, that's great. I think the middle. Thanks, Stephen, Bill, uh, Rob, Kelly. I'm here with my business partner. We've got a 100-person uh, internet media business. I'm wondering what would be the single most valuable piece of advice you'd give us to even attempt to create some of the value that you guys have done in both your very impressive companies? Well, I think, actually, maybe in both cases, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the excitement wasn't really seen the economic value. Uh, you know, even when we wrote down at Microsoft in 1975, a computer on every desk and in every home, we didn't realize, oh, and we'll have to be a big company. Uh, <laughs> uh, every time I thought, oh, God, can we double in size? Geez, can you manage that many people? Will that feel fun still? You know, and so every doubling was like, okay, this is the last one. Uh, and so the economic thing wasn't for at the forefront, the, the idea of being at the forefront and seeing new things and things we wanted to do and bringing in, being able to bring in different uh, people who are fun to work with eventually with a pretty broad set of skills and figuring out how to get those people, those broad skills to work well together has been one of the greatest challenges. Uh, you know, I've made more of my mistakes in that area maybe than, than any anywhere, uh, but, uh, you know, eventually getting uh, some of the, those teams to work very well together. So it's, you know, I think it's a lot about the people and the, the passion, uh, and it's amazing that the business worked out the, the way that it did. Yeah. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true, and the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard 
that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work, and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. So you've got to love it. You've got to have passion. And I think that's the high-order bit. The second thing is um, you've got to be you've got to be a really good talent scout. Because no matter how smart you are, uh, you need a team of great people. And you've got to figure out how to, how to size people up fairly quickly, make decisions without knowing people too well, and hire them and you know, see how you do and refine your intuition and be able to, to help you know, build an organization that can eventually just you know, build itself. Because um, you need great people around you. Thank you. Liz. Liz. Liz Beyer, a uh, question, I guess it's historical curiosity. You approach the same opportunity so very differently. What did you learn about running your own business that you wished you had thought of sooner or thought of first by watching the other guy? Well, I'd give a lot to have Steve's taste. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he has natural, uh, it, that, not a I joke at all. I, I think in terms of intuitive taste, both for people and products, you know, we, we sat in Mac product reviews where there were questions about software choices, how things would be done that I viewed as an engineering question, you know, and, uh, and you know, that's just how my mind works. And I'd see Steve make the decision based on a sense of people and product that, you know, it's even hard for me to explain. He, the way he does things, it, it's just different. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's magical. Uh, and in that case, wow. You know, Because Waz and I started the company based on doing the whole banana, we weren't so good at partnering with people. And, you know, actually, the funny thing is, Microsoft's one of the few companies we were able to partner with that actually worked for both companies. And uh, we weren't so good at that, as where, as where Bill and Microsoft were really good at it, because they, they didn't make the whole thing in the early days. And they, 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 they learned how to partner with people really well. And I think if Apple could have had that, a little more of that in its DNA, it would have served it extremely well. And, uh, and, and I don't think Apple learned that until, you know, several, a few decades later. <laughs> Last question. Right. Oh, 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 is there? This over here. I'm sorry, know. over here. Yeah, hi, uh, Charlie Brenner from Fidelity Investments. Um, in our financial services industry, we are focusing very strongly on aging and retiring baby boomers, a huge demographic. We're not that old. Oh. <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> the question is different from what it sounds like it's going to be. But um, most of the innovation that we see coming from computer and internet companies is kind of youth-oriented. And I'm just wondering if there are activities going on in your companies acknowledging what's going to oh, be happening generationally. Not, not true. I'll give you one example. So we started building in video cameras into almost all our computers a few years ago. And the response uh, by people of all ages, but in particular seniors, has been off the charts. Because they're buying these things now, and they're buying them for their, grand, their grandkids, their, their, their sons and daughters with their grandkids, so they can stay in touch with their grandkids. And they're video conferencing more than, than younger people are. And it's, it's incredible what this has done. So that's just one simple example. But there's like dozens of them that have clicked with, you know, seniors that are living independently that want to stay in touch with extended families and do other things like that. Yeah, I think that it's a very good point when you look at the size of the market. Uh, and that's partly why it's great that there are all these companies uh, out there who can see, okay, what would you do for seniors? I think natural user interface is particularly applicable here because the keyboard you know, we're sort of warped in that we grew up using the keyboard, and so it's extremely natural to us. But things like, and, and that's partly why when we showed the Surface computer, uh, I showed it privately to a bunch of CEOs a couple weeks ago. 
I was kind of stunned by how blown away they were. Uh, but the, their ease of navigation is just not the same. And when they saw that, the idea that they could organize their photo album, to the, to, it meant more to them than it did to me. Uh, I'll, I'll give you another example. We've got uh, a little shy of 200 retail stores now. And uh, one of the things the stores are doing is personal training now. It's called one-to-one. -one. And we are up to now a run rate of a million personal training sessions. They last an hour per year. A million per year. You only started a little while ago, right? Yeah. We started about a year ago. And uh, we're up to a million training sessions a year run right now. And a lot of those folks, some of them anyway, many of them are seniors. And they're coming in and they're spending an hour learning how to use Office and they're spending an hour learning how to video conference. And they can basically come in as much as they want and they can schedule these things throughout a year and they pay $99, I think, a year for it. And uh, it's been great. Last question. Now the last question over there. We all share a common science fiction experience of you know, the metaverse or the matrix where we all could communicate without being in the same place. And by the way, thank you both for providing us the best platform so far to go to chat rooms or to all go to a MySpace. It's a far cry from these things that we see on Star Trek or the holodeck. What kinds of things can you imagine that are part way there that could be much better than the three window eye chat that we might see in the next five or 10 years? Well, I don't, I don't think Steve's gonna announce his transporter uh, <laughs> I want Star Trek. <laughs> Just give me Star Trek. No, I think short of the transporter, most things you see in science fiction uh, are, in the next decade, the kinds of things you'll, you'll see. The, the virtual presence, the, the virtual world that both represents what's going on in the real world and represents whatever people are interested in. This you know, movement in space as a way of interacting with the machine. Uh, I think the deep investments that have been made at the research level will pay off with these things in, in the next 10 years. Steve? I don't know. And that's what makes it exciting to go into work every day. Because there's, as, as we talked about earlier, this is an extraordinarily uh, exciting time in the industry. And uh, lots of new stuff happening. So it, you know, I can't even begin to think of what it's going to be like 10 years from now. Great. Thank you so much. No, no. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great.